السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. جزاكم الله خيرا. I'll stand. It's it's probably easier. Keeps me awake. جزاكم الله خيرا. This is it's a first because it's the first time I'm doing something in this masjid. But a lot of the brothers I can see in the audience are people who who known me since I was about this big, bringing me to this mosque and trying to keep me from misbehaving too much. So um, so it's lovely to be back. Alhamdulillah. And to to have and mashallah the mosque has really expanded and and is facilitating for for young and old and the recitation of the young children mashallah the young little boy we just heard now it's all very very heartwarming these the, these efforts these are the fruits of the hard work that I was privileged to see um, the startings of in the early 90s um, and alhamdulillah you're all still here and and Allah bless this community. the brothers the sisters the young the old and take things from strength to strength inshallah so inshallah let me begin bismillahir rahmanir rahim inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu nasta'inuhu nastaghfiruhu nastaghfiruh wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyiati a'malina may yahdihillahu fala mudilla lahu wa may yudlilhu fala hadiyalah bismillahir rahmanir rahim inna alhamdulillah nahmaduhu nasta'inuhu واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله وصفيه من خلقه وحبيبه بلغ الاسلام وتاد الامانه ونصح الامه وجاهد في الله حق جهاده حتى اتاه اليقين صلوات الله تعالى عليه وعلى اهل بيت طيبين الطاهرين وصحابه الخر الميامين وتابعين له ولهم باحسان لا يوم الدين we begin by praising allah and testifying to his oneness invoking blessings and salutations upon our, upon our master muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam his household his companions and all that follow his way or aspire to until the end of days may allah azza wa jalla bless this gather, gathering today and bless us all inshallah to take what is beneficial and to be protected from from everything else inshallah the the topic is a sensitive one it's one that every community of muslims in the west in particular um need to grapple with at some point how do we do we handle this um uh th- this this sensitive area of of spaces for men and women interaction what does islam allow what doesn't it allow and so i want to begin i think just by reminding all of us that the deen is one which was revealed 1430 something years ago 40 something years ago from before the hijra to the master of both worlds muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in jazirat al arab in the in the deserts of arabia and yet it remains for every time for every place for every situation for every community entirely relevant and always continues to speak to us because at the very heart of our reality men and women young and old communities towns folk and villages our basic essential identity is the same we are servants of allah and we desire the same goals and we have the same journey to undertake and of course when people are laid to rest in their graves very soon they look exactly the same it doesn't matter if they traveled on camel back um from hundreds of years ago or if they 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 drove around uh performance cars in the 21st century it doesn't matter if they lived in rags or riches it doesn't matter if you lived in very urbanized um times or or not we we have the same journey ahead of us and that's really important to remember because so much of the time we find um it difficult to take the human being outside of an immediate context immediate context is important right now it's cold so you have coats on and you would have taken those coats off but when you go outside you put your coats back on you're not going to do the same thing in the summer and that can change from time to time and that's okay and allah azza wa jalla says a very interesting thing he says ya bani adam qad anzalna alaykum libasan yuwari sawatikum wa risha children of adam we have sent down to you clothing by which to cover your nakedness and also adornment allah knows that it has this dual purpose it's there's there's a functional purpose and then there's one that goes beyond that an aesthetic one the functional you need to cover your body you need to protect yourself from the elements but then there's this um, aesthetic thing as well you people like to look good which is why 
you can people spend a great deal of time trying to get the right outfit together and going shopping and and all this type of thing so Allah says these two things we've sent you clothing it covers your body and it provides adornment but the adornment of consciousness of your creator that is the most that is the best with which you can shroud yourselves and the deen has absolutely no problem whatsoever with being someone who likes to look good making an effort paying attention to things like that. no problem with that you want to wear gucci go for it you want to smell good you want to make sure that your hair looks good, go for that in fact there's a imam muslim relates the famous hadith where the prophet of allah said لا يدخل الجنة من كان في قلبه مثقال حبة من خردل من كبر. He cannot enter the garden of Jannah, of of paradise. The one who has in his heart uh, the amount of an, a mustard seed, a mustard seed's weight of arrogance, of pride. That's a tiny amount. If you've ever seen a mustard seed, it's small. He said, you can't go to heaven if you have as much as that in your heart. People became very worried. A sahabi stood up and said, Ya Rasulullah, inna rajul yuhib an yakuna na'luhu hasanan wa thawbuhu hasanan. He said, Ya Rasulullah, some people, <laughs> he, he, he said, a man, meaning maybe himself, likes to have nice clothes and nice hair. In one narration, nice shoes. So it's not just the girls who like nice shoes and, and, and things. You know, brothers can want to wear nice shoes and nice and have their hair looking good. So he said, in fact, the Prophet ﷺ says in one hadith, Man kana lahu sha'run fal yukrim. Anyone who happens to have hair, honor it. Look after your hair. If you've got, if you've been blessed to have good hair, if you're, it's not receded too far yet, then, then look after that. That's, that's also a blessing. And any blessing you have, you should look after. So this man's saying, you've just said anyone with, a, with an ounce of, with a mustard seed's worth of pride in his heart can't enter Jannah. But uh, what if I like to have nice hair or nice shoes, nice clothing? The Prophet of Allah, in response to this, said that famous hadith you've all heard. He said, Inna Allaha jameelun yuhibbul jamal. God is beautiful. He loves beauty. So that's not the problem. Arrogance, though, pride, is to put down others and to withhold the truth. So this is where he's helping us to make this journey. Allah says, The believing men and the believing women, they are helpers aids, supports, and protectors one of another. They help each other out. They are a family. This is, there is a bond that keeps them together. They enjoin one another to good, and they warn one another from bad, and they race, make haste towards good things. This deen from its very beginnings was not a deen that separated communities it's not a misogynistic or a discriminatory thing this is Allah's message to the whole of the world in fact and we know very you know of, 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 of many women companions who came to the Prophet of Allah and said Ya Rasulullah you, you always uh, make time for the men you need to make time for the women too and he he'd arranged those type of things and the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in everything that we do, we look to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. What is his example? And there are two important reasons for doing that. Number one, he is Rasulul Rabbil Alameen. He is the one sent of the Lord of all of the worlds. So if he's, his, his example is the one that we follow. He has been instructed to say to us, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهِ فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ الله. You claim to love Allah. If you do truly love Allah, follow me. Follow me and Allah will love you. And he will forgive you your sins. So our route to achieving the good pleasure of Allah, to obtaining the great good of this world and the hereafter, the felicity of the dunya and the akhirah, the route to that is in following the Messenger wasallam. So that's the first reason, because we have to follow him. But also because nothing that he did was incidental. 
He didn't just do something. If he did it, there's always a very, very good reason behind it. And therefore, to try to understand the wisdoms, rather than to become fixated on just the outer form, to understand and delve deeper into what what is the reasoning behind this, has been a, a, something that has preoccupied scholarship from the fuqaha, the scholars of hadith, commentators of hadith, from the earliest of times, the Imams of Fiqh, Imam Abu Hanifa, Malik, Shafi'i, Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, rahimahumullah, and the many others. The whole pursuit was trying to work out because the, Allah Azza wa Jal says about His Messenger, "Ma yantiqu anil hawa." The Messenger doesn't speak of his own desire, of his own um, caprice, his own uh, want. In huwa illa wahyun yuha. It is but revelation with which he's inspired. So if he's been, if he said a thing, if he's done a thing. And Allah Azza wa Jal has approved of that because if there is ever an occasion, and God's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was the best of all creation, Imam Al Busiri. This is, you know, very close to the the time when people commemorate his his birth and remember the the, the great uh, blessing of Allah upon this Ummah in giving us this Prophet Rabi Al Awwal. And people mention the Burda Burda Sharif. Busiri would say, Wa mablaghul ilmi fihi annahu basharu. The extent of our knowledge regarding him is that he was indeed a man. And yet he is the best of not just humankind, the best of all of God's creation in its entirety. So he was a man, but he was the very best of all creation. And therefore, did he, if he ever said a thing or did a thing, if he ever approved of a thing that was done in his presence, that becomes a hujjah, an example to follow. And this is where the term sunnah, which literally means to set a, a precedent, to do something that becomes an example for others to follow, comes in. The messenger's actions, his words, his, his practices, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are all sunnah. And therefore, we follow him because there is our guidance in that. We follow him because there is deep wisdom. It's not an accident. It didn't just happen. And so you stand to make salah. And in that, you want to know, what is the sunnah? Where should I place my hands? Where should I put my... Uh, you know, how close should I stand? The Imam says, We want to stand close together and be... Uh, and, and there can be differences in the interpretation of the Sunnah, and that's fine. It's wrong to become absolutist about the Sunnah. It's wrong to, to, to say, here's my reading of this hadith, and therefore, if you do anything different to that, do you place your hands here, or do you place them here, or do you have them by your side? All of that is incorporated within readings of the Sunnah, and all of it is rightly guided. Imam Malik ibn Anas the great Malik of, of uh, the great scholar of Medina, Imam Udar al Hijra. Harun al Rashid was so impressed um, by his, his work, Al Muwatta, that he said, I want to have this work uh, printed. I want to make copies of it and have it sent to all of the different Muslim lands, the Muslim territories, in order to bring all of the people of the East and the West, because there are Muslims in. Uh, all over the world, and, and, and they come from different communities and cultures, and they follow different scholars, just as we have today. We've got Muslims from Africa, and Muslims from South Asia, and Muslims from Indonesia, and Muslims from Eastern Europe, and Western Europe, and all over the world. So uh, Harun Rashid said, I'd, I'd like to bring everybody onto one tradition, to unify, to standardize the practice. And so I'm going to use this, the Muwatta, to do that. Imam Malik said, Ya Amir al Mu'minin, la tafal. Please don't do this. Most of us would be, you know, so happy if, if someone said, your book is going to become the standard and the head of state says, the, 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 the head of the Muslim community says, I'm going to make this the official practice for the entire Muslim world. You are going to be the official, undisputed, unchallenged imam of the entire ummah. Most people would be elated, would be over the moon. Yes, I've become the great imam. Imam Malik says, please don't do that. And then he explains why. He said, the Sahaba of the Messenger وسلم, spread throughout the land. And each took <coughs> what he had seen and understood from the Messenger of Allah وسلم, wherever he went. And the people of these regions took that and they practiced that. And he said, وَكُلٌّ عَلَىٰ هُدًا 
So although their practices may vary, you might find some of the Malikiyah preferring to place their hands on their sides, whilst the Hanafis like to keep them beneath the navel, whilst the Shafi'is like to keep them here. Ahmad ibn Hanbal, by the way, his, prefer his, pref his, his preferred position was to keep it beneath the navel too. al uh, Mughni uh, ibn Qudama mentions in the Mughni. So it's very similar to the Hanafi position. So whilst there's three or four different ways of where to put your hands in prayer, kullun ala huda, all are on right guidance. Why? Kullun yuridu Allah wa rasula. Because their hands may be in different places, their hearts are in exactly the same place. All desire obedience to God and his messenger. All of this is founded from that. It's not for me to become a dictator and say, you can't pay attention to anybody else's understanding of the hadith or the sunnah, only mine. So that's wrong. So we don't do that. But the sunnah is important to us. And so we want to know whatever our route of approaching the sunnah is through scholars, through traditions of, 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 of chains of learning, whatever that is, we want to know, where do I place my hands? Where do I place my feet? Where do I look when I'm in salah? How many times do I make tasbih in ruku? How many times do I say, should I recite what, what, the surahs in prayer in a certain order? Is, it, is there a problem if I recite a very short surah in the first rakah and a lengthy surah in the second? All of these things we pay attention to detail. We want to make sure that we've got the practice as close as we possibly can to the practice of the Prophet And, though, well, having said all of this, isn't it interesting, though, that the one place there happens to be at this time an almost like a, a uniform um, agreement to not practice the sunnah is when it comes to how the Prophet of Allah وسلم, organized his masjid. And here you'll find the Hanafis and the Shafi'is, the Salafis and the Sufis, the Diobandis and the Brelfis and the Ikhwanis, and everybody's on the same page in this, almost. In that we don't have our masjids looking as the Prophet of Allah did. And I'm not talking about your lighting and, and, and the, the uh, furnishings. But he said his sunnah was that he'd have the, the sufuf of the men. The men would make rows. And then the children would make rows. And then the women would make rows. And this was his sunnah. And he, as well as being the Rasul of Allah to the entirety of the, the world, he was also the Imam of a masjid for a, an entire decade, for 10 years. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa And in all of that time, is it an accident or is there some reasoning behind the fact that in all of that time he didn't say, Let's, let's put up a curtain. Let's put the women behind the curtain and the brothers at the front. In all of that time, because most of us, if somebody said, brother, we're going to have a prayer facility put up here in the local hospital, in the, in the, in the school, in, in X, Y, or Z place, the first thing we'll do is, yeah, so mashallah, very good. Where's the women's section? Where's the brother's section? Let's, let's do it that way. But for 10 years of being imam, he didn't do that. He did something else. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong that you have a women's... I'm so happy you have women in the masjid at all. Alhamdulillah. Really, I am. This is, the point of this is not to say from tomorrow, in fact, from Fajr, can you please make sure the women are there and the brothers... I, I understand that that... But the point that I'm trying to make is, well, inshallah, if you follow me, we'll get to. The Prophet of Allah وسلم, had something that he was doing. It's not an accident. It didn't just happen. He didn't sort of forget that there's women there. There was a purpose to this. And the purpose to that is what I think we need to concentrate on. The practice that by all means can, can, can be uh, adapted to our circumstances, to our situations. No problem with that whatsoever. But let's understand the hikmah of the sunnah. What was he doing? Why didn't he place a big curtain? Out of sight, out of mind. See no evil, hear no evil. Sisters, go back upstairs. No, I'm joking. What, what was he doing? What he was doing was rather than, or the way of the Prophet of Allah was rather than to, uh, to, to pass the responsibility of public morality onto a screen, onto a curtain, onto an inanimate thing. Because when you can't see, then you can't, there's no interaction. Rather than to do that, he wanted individuals to develop inside themselves. He wanted to invest in the individuals. And so he taught us in the masjid. Why, why was he doing this? Because you can quite easily segregate a masjid, no problem. 
you can't segregate the world outside of the masjid. There's still the marketplace. There's still the, uh, the, the, the farms, the khet, you know, there's still where people go to get their water. There's still all of these other regions of the world where by necessity, men and women will need to interact. He was disciplining and developing his community for the marketplace starting from inside the masjid. This is what the Prophet of Allah was doing. And so he taught adab. He taught etiquette. He had them all in the same place. And then he said, The man, This is hadith in, in Muslim. Abu Huraira relates. The best of rows for men are the, 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 most, uh, the first rows. The worst of rows for men are the lattermost rows, the, the rows at the back. But the reverse for women. He said the best of rows for women are those that are the furthest back. And the least preferable of rows for women are those which are right at the front. In other words, when you come in, and all of the scholars agree that this hadith can only be practiced when men and women are making salah in the same place. Because otherwise the preferability for both men and women is to be as far forward as possible. But this hadith is in the context of people praying in the same place. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, to the women that they should delay rising from sajda, just by a small amount, in order to let the men have risen first, so that if anybody, there were people who were ex extremely poor, who had very limited clothing, uh, and literally wrapped, uh, wrapped like, you know, a sheet of cloth, uh, like a lunki, um, which wasn't very long, right? So if they're in sajda, they might be uh, feeling, you know, uncomfortable about, being exposed. So he said to the women to delay their rising from sujood a little bit to allow the men to rise first. And he said to the men to delay turning around after salah and leaving the prayer until the women have had the opportunity to get up and leave for the, from the masjid. So that people aren't. So what he's doing is he's teaching interaction. He's not teaching because our Messenger وسلم, did not come for. Uh, some some you know sort of made up world where Allah speaks about you know the the sweet and the salty waters it, this isn't the way that the world operates you don't have men on one side and women on one side and never will the two ever cross paths so he's teaching us how to be respectful he teaches he says that the women should come to the masjid and not apply perfume because the smell of perfume may. He said that women in Salah, if the Imam makes a mistake, absolutely they can alert the Imam to the mistake of the, uh, that he's made. They should do that by doing this, tasfiq. Because uh, to make takbir, and if they, they raise their voice, then somebody in the prayer might become distracted by a particularly sweet-sounding voice. And he was not afraid of, of setting these things. It's important that people learn the fiqh of Salah. Because if you, if you are in a place like that and somebody starts clapping, that's not a round of applause. That's to tell you you've made a mistake, right? So if it's coming from the women. The men, they will say, subhanallah, if to alert that there is a mistake. So, at-tasbihu lil-rijal wa tasfiqu lil-nisa. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he... Now, so the, we can ask the question then. So, and I've answered part of it. What, what is the thinking behind it? The men and the women both have a need to take from whatever it is Allah Azza wa Jal sends down in these houses. These are houses for the remembrance of Allah. Fi buyutin adhin Allahu an turfa. These are houses that God has ordained in which His memory, His 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 mention should be raised. This is the powerhouse. Where do you learn your deen? Where do you learn to be inspired? Where in a place of worship? And this masjid is, is and, and alhamdulillah, you have a few masajid in Peterborough which are good like that, which accommodate for women, which don't neglect the fact that women are also spiritual beings. Before the ruh is breathed into the embryo that's developing in the womb of a mother somewhere, the ruh is neither male or female. Did you know that? At the heart of it, you're not men or women, you're ruh. And the ruh is a spirit, it is a soul. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, الَّذِي أَحْسَنَ كُلَّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَهُ God, everything that He created, He created beautifully. وَبَدَأَ خَلْقَ الْإِنسَانِ مِنْ طِينَ 
The creation of man he began from clay, from earth, from 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 mud. ثُمَّ سَوَّاهُ وَنَفَخَ فِيهِ مِنْ رُوحِهِ Then he formed it with due proportion. He formed it well. And when it was ready, he breathed into it of his ruh. And that's the language Allah uses. I breathed into it a ruh that is so close to me, I call it my own. And Allah Azza wa Jalla says in another place, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِّ الروح. They ask you about the soul. People can find out about everything, things on the surface of Mars and things in the bottom of the ocean, the way that atoms are structured and and and, and the way that light travels in waves. We can uh, travels and, and sound travels in waves. We can experience or explore all of these things, but the one thing ultimately we're still unable to to really grapple with is the essence of our own souls. Allah says, "Yes, alunaka an ruh." So they ask you about the soul. Tell us about the soul. Say the soul is from the affairs of my Lord. There is no intermediary between the soul and Allah. Everything else comes, but the soul is directly from Allah. And as much as you grow in your knowledge of the sciences and 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 and, and, and your knowledge of physics and your knowledge of things at a subatomic level, and you you will still never be any closer to unraveling this secret. For whatever you have been granted of knowledge is little compared to that. So the ruh is neither boy or girl. It's neither male or female. The ruh is 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 something which Allah Azza wa Jal presented before himself. The ruh, the souls of all of the children of Adam. And to all of them he said, am I not your Lord? And every ruh affirmed, indeed you are. That is the ruh. The ruh is something that acknowledges, acknowledged its creator before it acknowledged even itself. And that's what he breathed into you and me, into every human being that lives. Boy, girl, male, female, rich, old, east, west. Who later goes on to be atheist or theist, Christian, Buddhist, Jew, Zen, whatever. The ruh is what we carry. And everyone has a need for the ruh to be fed. The, the feeding, the nourishment of the soul is, is crucial. And if we have a situation where mosques are closed to women, then we have a situation where everything else in society is, has its doors wide open. Girls are allowed to, are able to go to school and college and university, are able to go shopping and able to go hang out in bowling alleys and everything else is there. And the one place that they could receive something for the soul is denied to them. Then we have a very dangerous situation for entire communities. No community can exist with that, including that twin half. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu said, إِنَّمَا nisa شَقَائِقَ rijal." Women are the twin halves of men. Societies traditionally, historically, have tended to be quite patriarchal in, in that the, it's male-dominated. And women, by their nature, have haya and, and, and modesty and are bashful and shy. And that's a beautiful thing that Allah has blessed them with. But they can't be neglected. And this is why the Prophet of Allah said, لا تمنعوا إما الله مساجد الله Do not prohibit, do not prevent the women servants of God access to coming to his houses, the masajid. Don't prevent women from coming to the, the, the mosque. Why? Because if you do that, then you have a situation where the men, alhamdulillah, are coming to prayers, are getting to listen to the imam. You know, for boys in many places, the situation is exactly this. There can be a young man who's maybe even, you know, we're all human beings. And we're all, uh, Iqbal said, the, the famous poet, philosopher of the subcontinent said, as in part of his shikwa, he said, you threw a, a plank of wood into the ocean and then you asked it to stay dry. Meaning, how can we not become, there, there's every, we're, we're, this is the dunya, and everything around it is calling us and pulling us and distracting us and influencing us and contaminating us. And so this is the world that you're a part of. And this is today's reality. And yet, Islam came for today as much as it came for 1400 years ago. It's not afraid of the challenges posed by the age of multimedia and the age of the smartphone and the age of, you know, madness um, and, 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 you know, materialism, uh, where people turn towards celebrities and their examples and ignore their parents and their brothers and sisters. Even for this day and age, Islam is relevant and it's here to respond to the challenges of today. But that is by returning back to... Now, 
I've just mentioned that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu said, don't prohibit women from coming to the mosques. And if we do that, we have a society where men, men come to the mosques, boys, even if they're not always in the best of behavior, boys all, you know, will, will go to school, college, university, maybe go to work, maybe they've got involved in relationships that aren't Islamic, nor are they healthy, maybe they've got involved in experimenting with substances, maybe they're, they're, they're listening to crazy, you know, music and, 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 and things, and they're in bad environments, and yet, for that, because he's a boy, the door of the masjid is always is always accessible, and he might one day just be p passing by and the adhan for maghrib is taking place, and he thinks, you know what, I'll pop inside, and he steps inside the masjid, and he 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 rolls up his sleeves, he goes into the wudu place, and he makes wudu, and with the water he washes himself, and there's a purification happening just then, and then he steps into the masjid and he takes his place, standing side by side, one of his brothers. And he joins a group of worshippers worshipping Allah Azza wa And just being, just taking part in that is transformative. It's cleansing. Everything else that happens, think about it, right? We have uh, maybe like our TV channels are set to, um, you know, Indian uh, drama things uh, for like 24-7. But you step out, you come to the masjid. It's uh, maybe maybe you come to a talk, maybe you come to a khutbah on a Friday, maybe there's a group of brothers, someone's doing a hadith reading, maybe the imam saying, and you, two words fall into your ears and they might pour, give you uh, pause for thought, they might cause you to reflect, they might touch your heart in, the, in one way. And then you'll go back out and you'll carry on, but there's something that you take away with you. If women are denied that, and we have a situation where the men are coming to the mosques but their wives are at home, um, binging on Bollywood or, or, or you know whatever it is and that's all that's happening there's, there's people here coming to pray and the women at home there's nothing for them except for that rubbish and it's, it's, it's soul destroying and as well as mind destroying and that's all that's happening we have a huge disconnect in societies we have and then prominent people will then sit around guys will piously talk about how the women are all messed up today and subhanallah well we can't expect the women to be like the women of the the, the sahabiyat if the men are not like the sahaba the men are not pre preparing an environment which is inclusive and by that i don't simply mean that we become mashallah you know we're praying five times a day our Masajid need to be accommodating and inclusive, and that is the secret to the success of the Medina example, the example of the Prophet ﷺ. It included both. And alhamdulillah, again, I'm not, I, I've been asked to speak on this topic, and it's an important one, so I'm going to be frank with you. In some places, in many, many Masajid which have a, an, an indo pak heritage, a subcontinent heritage, there is, because if you go to Bangladesh, if you go to Pakistan right now, you can go to how many mosques accommodate for women? They don't, right? They don't accommodate for women. Women can pray at home. That's fine. What if they're not at home? What if you've gone shopping? Then they don't need to pray. They'll pray when they go home. Namaz maaf because of uh, Boxing Day sales. But it's not, right? This is, the, this is the first of what we are held to account for. The first of the obligations which Allah sent down. In fact, he didn't send it down. He called up his beloved to give him this obligation for his ummah the men and the women. This is a sacred bond that we have. And it's not fair to, to, to expel, to exclude half, maybe more than half of the community because we don't. So we have a subcontinent heritage. Traditionally, there was, the mosque was a very, very much a male preserve and it's remained that way. Now that we start in some places like this wonderful example of a masjid here, and some of your other masajid also in Peterborough, they're accommodating women. That is a wonderful, wonderful step. But let's go a step beyond that. I've said already the Prophet's model, the men and the women occupy the same space. And there, I want you to ask yourselves, have you, you noticed ever a, the difference? The difference between two scenarios. Between stepping into a masjid and joining a group of people and hearing words of Allah and his messenger وسلم, being physically present being live as well as the the sound as well as what's being said you get to share in be a part of and take from 
an atmosphere. And the atmosphere itself is can sometimes be uh, part of the, 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 the cleansing process. Sometimes just by stepping into a place, mashallah, in Ramadan, taraweeh, you know, or when you come for the Fajr prayer, the whole mosque is full. You step in. Just stepping inside, your iman is being rejuvenated. Is that not true? You feel that. Just stepping into a good environment. There's a reason that people will pay silly amounts of money to go and watch their team in a, in, in a football stadium when you could just watch it on, on, online or you could watch it on the television. But being there, there is something amazing that happens. And we know that Islamically as well as otherwise, Islamically, we know that Allah Azza wa Jal has malaika, sayyahin, angels that travel through the land. Wherever they find a collective of individuals remembering Allah, they stop too and they join them and they go back to the heavens. And Allah Azza wa Jal announces, these people got together for my remembrance, I've forgiven all of them. And Allah, the Prophet of Allah said, Rahma descends, Sakina descends, angels in shroud. These are blessed gatherings. And now compare that to watching the, exactly the same lecture on YouTube. You're hearing the same content. Everything the Imam said when you were live is also on YouTube. And somehow it's not exactly the same thing. In terms of information, absolutely. You can, you, you can catch every single word. But there's a difference. There is such a big difference. Is that not true? Because if it were true, if I said to you all, some great scholar is coming here tomorrow. Right? Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Everyone likes Hamza Yusuf. Hamza Yusuf comes to Peterborough tomorrow, to this masjid. Do you think you'll have a full house or not? What do you think? The whole of Peterborough will try to squeeze itself onto the, into this little masjid. Hamza Yusuf is accessible on all of your smartphones any time that you want by searching his name in YouTube. So why don't, why don't we all spend all of our time watching that? Because, yeah, that's, that's something he did before. It's accessible, it's online, it's not the same thing. Being here in the flesh and the blood, being physically a part of something is transformative. And it's, that is what, and also now think about the difference between that and hearing a voice and you can't see, like you listen to something uh, when you're driving on the radio. Some people listen to the radio as they're falling asleep. It puts them to sleep. And if that is what, that is the only thing that women have available to them. The men get to be here. And the women are in a back room and they have a sound system which, which conveys the voice, but they're looking at a nice white wall then they can feel disconnected, they can find it hard to connect, they can find it difficult to become, to feel spiritually as a part of the same thing. And this is another part of why the Prophet of Allah wanted the spiritual experience, the, uh, the, the, the Iman um, rejuvenating experience to be accessible to men and to women. Because the success of any faith community depends on the ability of both the men and the women, both halves of society, to be able to become spiritually replenished. And this is why. Now, over time, it is absolutely true. Islam traveled east and west. It went to the Balkans and it went throughout Khurasan and Persia. It came to the subcontinent. It went to Africa. And wherever it went, people adapted Islam to their cultural reality, not even necessarily consciously. But you'll notice today if you travel, if you went to Malaysia, you'll notice that the Islamic experience or the way that mosques were organized uh, is, is, is notably different, uh, noticeably different to the, the way it is in Pakistan, to the way that it might be in Turkey, to the way that you'll find if you go to Timbuktu in Mali, to the, what you'll see if you went to uh, Azerbaijan. Everywhere is, is, is just within one Indo-Pak, think of the Indian subcontinent. If you go to Bangladesh, and there's a, you'll notice these are certain things that are done which are part of the Bengali experience which are different to what's done in Punjab. And within one Pakistan you'll find there's a difference between Sindh and a bit difference between Punjab and a difference between the people of the northwest frontier province. And if you go to India you'll find that the people of Hyderabad Dakkan and the people of Delhi and the people of uh, you know, Muradabad, they all have their... These are the cultural things and Islam is so cool with that. It's not a problem. Islam didn't come to say, all of you become Arab, please. Islam is, Allah says, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبْ East and West belong to Him. 
Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ خَلْقُ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَاتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ From his signs are the creation of heaven and earth and the diversity of your tongues and, and your skin colors. Islam is for the African and it's for the Asian, it's for the European and it's for the, 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 the you know, person from the Far East. It's for everybody. And so people adapted to their realities. Now, if you have a society which historically has been one that operated very much more on patriarchal lines, where the men were in the working environment, the women were not in that environment, that's the way the society was set up, then Islam came and, and people adapted those things and it stayed the same. But what's interesting if we look in some of our works of fiqh, and I'm going to reference the Hanafi fiqh text of Hidayah, which anyone who's studying a Sharia course in uh, Hanafi fiqh will have to study. And this is Imam al marghinani you know, going back 800 years, speaks about, um, is it a permissible or, or in terms of male-female interaction? We have hijab in our deen. And hijab is, 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 a, is, what is the point of hijab? Is hijab about ending uh, any contact? No, hijab is about empowering individuals, enabling healthy, productive, necessary interaction while excluding all of the nastiness that is no one else's business. Hijab is about a woman being able to say, I am, you know, the way that I look, and the shape of my body and is, no, is nobody else's business. That's nothing to do with you. And so don't expect me to share that with you. But I'm an intelligent uh, being. I'm an articulate being. And I will continue to interact in society without you having any rights whatsoever to uh, my body. And this is a very interesting thing if you think about it. If we think about it. We live in a time of, of massive progress. Great strides are taken in uh, equality, right, and the, the workforce and everywhere else between men and f women and all of these things. Now, next time you walk into your bank, your local uh, bank, imagine you walk in and you say, I want to see the bank manager, and a man comes to see you, and he's got a suit and tie on, and, but he's wearing shorts. That, that would be weird, right? The bank manager is a middle-aged man who's, whose legs are on display. What's the, you're not playing football or rugby. We don't need to see your legs. But if it happens to be a woman, her legs are almost a part of her job description. Why? It's cold. You feel the cold as much as anybody else does. Why does Western society we almost have an unspoken expectation that women have to get doled up for the benefit? No. She's a professional. She's an intellectual. She's a, a person of great qualities. And none of those have anything to do with her body. Her body is nobody else's business, just as... A middle-aged man can be overweight, he can, he can, that's nobody else's business. He can still be the CEO of a big company, and, but a woman is expected to look a certain way. So she has to spend a certain amount of time in front of the mirror every morning, getting her hair just right and her, the tone of her skin just right, etc., etc., etc. It might be cold. and I've never tried it, but I don't imagine walking around in high heels is very comfortable. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, they, they say certain things are, you know, you have to practice. And so why does anyone put themselves through those things? Because people say, oh, it's, it's, it's doing it for myself. Well, you know, that's another debate. And I guess I shouldn't really verge too much into that debate. But the point that I'm making is it, we have two extremes. We have an extreme that's, that has almost a sense of complete segregation. And we have another extreme which is one that speaks about complete inclusivity, but it's actually quite predatory. It preys on women to say, we, have, we want to sell a car, we need a woman's body as a part of that process. We want to advertise, uh, you know, ice cream. A woman has to look quite seductive. And be, what's that got to do with ice cream? Or the car, or anything else for that matter. So that's, there's, there's a real unfairness, inherent unfairness in this. Islam is always in between extremes. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah revealed to him, when the female buried alive will be asked, what was her crime that they killed her like this? Islam came to liberate women who were physically as well as 
uh, metaphysically denied their rights buried alive. Whether actually buried alive as children were, or whether that's in the way of being denied ownership, being denied the, the Prophet of Allah, he was employed by a female, Khadija bint al Khuwailid, our mother, Khadija al Kubra, radiallahu anha. She employs the messenger and is his boss, and he works for her. She's a highly successful businesswoman. So now, because of, um, oftentimes people say, well, you know, we live in times of Sahaba, it's fine that you say that the men and the women prayed in the same place, and there are numerous evidences that the, the men and the women were interacting. But that was the time of the Sahaba. We're not the Sahaba. Times have changed, bad things have, uh, you know, happen nowadays, and so we have to become a bit more uh, careful, a bit more precautionary, and have extra um, safeguards in place. That, that, that is a sentiment which... Uh, is one that there is, you know, comes from a very good place. It comes from a deep concern to protect the integrity, the purity, the chastity of the community. And that is a beautiful intention. In practical terms, it's not very useful. And let me explain to you what I mean by that. Allah Jalla says in the Quran about Christians. Monasticism, being monks and nuns and devoting yourselves to these monasteries and taking on these, um, uh, you know, these, these undertakings. A monk can never marry. He can never wear nice clothes. He can never eat certain types of food, etc., etc., etc. So these are the oaths. You know, that a monk has and a nun, similar type of thing. Allah says, وَرَهْبَانِيَةً ibtadauha." Monasticism is a thing that they innovated. Bid'a, ibtada'uha. They made it up. Ma katabnaha alayhim. This is not something that we required of them, that we enjoined or prescribed to them. Allah did, never said, don't marry. Allah never said, don't eat nice food. Allah at no point said, you mustn't wear, you can only wear really coarse, uncomfortable clothing. Allah says, this is something they did. But then Allah is always fair. So he says, illa abtigha amardatillah. They did it seeking the good pleasure of Allah. He acknowledges the, the, the goodness of their intentions. They took these, uh, this very austere, frugal way of life upon themselves, seeking a great thing. What is it that they were seeking? To be superhuman. Angels don't eat and drink, and angels don't partake in any of these worldly things. And they wanted to rise above the flesh to realize the purity of the, the spirit and become as close to God as they could. Allah acknowledges this is a good thing that they intended. Then Allah explains but the problem with this. And the problem is anytime you try to deny your nature, you set yourself up to fail. You seek to become superhuman, you end up falling to subhuman depths. Allah says, but they were unable to maintain it. فَمَا رَعَوْهَا حَقَّ رِعَيَتِهَا They were unable to keep this up, to, do, to give it its due. Because it's not your nature. He created you with, an, with a belly, you're going to feel hungry, so don't deny yourself eating and drinking. He created you inbuilt, programmed to seek a partner and to want to, in order that the, 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 the humankind, uh, the, 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 our, this community continues to grow. He made you men and women to, to populate the earth. So if you deny that part of your nature, then you're going to fall into trouble. And so though they came with great wonderful intentions, monasteries soon became places where terrible, terrible things took place. And they excavate, even till now, unearth uh, old monasteries, and they've uh, unearthed the, the bones of, of women who were pregnant, monks who had managed to get women pregnant and then had to do something about this, and they were killed and, and buried and and you know about the whole uh, abuse of children which has become massively scandalous for the roman catholic church because roman catholic priests cannot marry celibacy wherever this was practiced ultimately great evil took place while intending an amazing good and then we come back to islam the prophet of allah in the famous hadith which you've all heard many a time Three companions came to his home. They asked his wives. And the ummah could come to the wives of our Prophet ﷺ and ask questions. 
And the Quran acknowledges that. And so they said, tell us about the worship of God's Messenger Sallallahu when he's at home. What is he like? How does, he, does he spend all night worshipping? Does he spend all day? So the wife said, you know, he's our husband. And he'll talk to us and he'll have conversations with, and he'll clean some, and, you know, and he'll do this. And, and then when we go to sleep, he'll also get up and worship. And when they'd mentioned our mothers, the Ummahat al Mu'min, when they mentioned the, me, the worship of God's Messenger in his home, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the narrator says, فَكَأَنَّهُ مُسْتَقَالُوهَا It's almost like they thought that was not, like, they're expecting something to really, you know, knock them back. And they were maybe slightly underwhelmed by what they heard. So then they said, أَيْنَ نَحْنُ مِنْ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ وَقَدْ غَفْرَ اللَّهُ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِنْ ذَنْبِهِ وَمَا تَأَخَرْ How can we even compare ourselves to the Prophet ﷺ? God has already announced he is... The, 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 the best of all creation and any mistakes past, present, future Allah already announced they are wiped away but we on the other hand we sin by day and by night so if the Prophet is doing this much we, we can't suffice with just that we have to exert ourselves further so they started deciding what should we do one of them said he made a thing he took on a pledge he said I will fast every day and never miss a day of fasting I'll fast always and never be without fast. The other one said, I'm going to uh, spend the whole night in worship, in ibadah, and I'll never rest in the night time. So one said he's going to spend all, every single day fasting. The other one said he'll spend every, all of the night worshipping. The third one was left with the short straw. He said, I won't marry <laughs> I'll go celibate. I'm not going to marry women. When the Prophet of Allah came home and he was told about this, he said, where are these three people who make such undertakings that they're going to fast all day and worship all night and never get married? Am I not the best of you and am I not your messenger? Am I not the one who fears Allah the most among you? Am I not the most knowledgeable of Allah among you? For by Allah, أَصُومُ uftir. I fast some days, I don't fast other days. And I stand to worship by night and I also rest my head and sleep for some portion of the night. And I have married. And this is where he says this. This is my sunnah, a sunnah of moderation. Not of denying any aspect of your nature, but of finding a way to be human at the same time, to uh, worship in a sublime way. This is my nature. فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي Anyone who dismisses, turns away from my sunnah, it's not good enough for you, فَلَيْسَ minni, then you're not from me. So Allah says to us that the Christians who came before us, they, out of an earnest desire for achieving something great, denied their human uh, nature. And soon they set themselves up to a place where bad things happened. And when these three companions came, the Prophet disliked, disapproved of their denying their and going to this extreme. He said, maintain the balance. Allah Azza wa has set down the balance. Don't disrupt the balance. And in a similar way, we have, when we have a communities, when we have communities, and I'm being frank here, in wherever they are in the world, whether that's in the Middle East, whether that's in the Asian subcontinent or elsewhere, which moved away from the model of our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Medina, and created a, this place where men only could have access to the mosques. Women can't come to a mosque. Why can't a woman come to the mosque? Oh, that's going to upset our hijab. Like it's contrary to hijab. Why she can be in hijab? No, but the very presence of a female in the masjid is somehow it's it's going to upset the environment. But it's fine in the marketplace. It's fine everywhere else so why why this wherever this has happened it's led to an unhealthy situation and it is true many women will say that they feel less secure walking down the street in sometimes in a muslim country on their own than they do in the countries of uh, non-muslim countries in the west you can ask this question to your mothers and your sisters and 
people have had that experience, whether it's going to somewhere in the Middle East, whether it's going, unfortunately, even to Saudi Arabia, whether it's going to Pakistan or to Bangladesh. In, it's, the outside environment is not a very secure environment for a woman on her own. If she needs to go to the shops, go and buy a few things and then get on the bus, imagine doing that in Lahore, imagine do that, doing that in, in Silet. It's not necessarily... Uh, because we have a society which operated on such, along such segregated lines. At no point were the men and the women, the boys and the girls, the two halves that make up this community, given the opportunity to learn how to interact with one another in a disciplined and respectful way. This is what Islam came to teach. And when you, when you place, if you place a child in a, in, in a bubble, if you place a human being inside a, a vacuum, a bubble, to protect him from every virus and every germ and every bacteria and every bad thing out there, all that will happen is the moment he steps out of that bubble, he's going to drop dead of the common cold. He's not had the chance to become immunized to anything. In the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Sahaba, the best of all creation after the Prophets, the best of all humanity after the Prophets are the Sahaba. Ridwanullahi alayhi majma'een. Amongst them, they were human beings too. And I'm going to mention to you a hadith from Bukhari and Muslim. A Sahabi was selling dates. He's selling dates in the marketplace. And he says, a, a woman came to buy dates and I was taken aback by her beauty. And for a moment, he, he, he sort of takes leave of his senses. And he says, I was, I was dazzled by, by the beauty of this woman. And she's innocently just looking at dates. And she's, she's looking and I said, and the man, the Sahabi said to her, he said, I have better dates around the back. And she, she innocently said, okay, and she came to look. And as soon as he, she came around the back, he planted a kiss on her. He said, فَأَصَابَ مِنْهَا قُبْلَ He somehow couldn't contain himself and he kissed. And as soon as he'd done that, he thought, what have I done? I've, I've just done this. I've touched a woman. And he left her right there and he ran to the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say, Ya Rasulullah, I'm destroyed, I'm destroyed. The Prophet said, what's happened, what's happened? He said, Asabtu min amra'atin qubla. I, I, I planted a kiss on a woman who's not my wife. At this moment, uh, we should probably stop to think about the poor woman. She must have been a very um, confusing situation because she's now left in the shop and he's run off. And Anyway, so the, the Rasul alayhi salatu wasalam, what did he do? This is the hadith, it's in Bukhari and Muslim. He said, أَقِمِ الصَّلَاةَ طَرَفَ يِنَّهَارِ وَزُلَفًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ Establish prayer. Focus on getting your relationship with Allah very, very strong again. At the two ends of the day and during certain portions of the night. إِنَّ الْحَسَنَاتِ يُذْهِبْنَ السَّيِّئَاتِ Indeed, it is good, only good, that is capable of wiping away bad. ذَلِكَ ذِكْرَى لِلذَّاكِرِينَ This is a reminder for the mindful. Instead of becoming fixated on the negative, the bad thing that had happened, and the bad thing had no doubt just taken place, the way of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, to resolve this was to place an incredible focus on good, on positivity, not on negativity. The, the, the way that we address evil is by an increased focus and an increased promoting and getting busy with good. That's the only thing that can cure. Darkness exists, light exists. The only thing light needs to do to defeat darkness is to be there. It doesn't need to do anything else. It doesn't need knuckle dusters. It doesn't need a baseball bat. It just needs to be. Light only needs to exist. Darkness has to recede. And so the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, this is, he's just been faced with a man who's saying, Ya Rasul, I just I grabbed hold of a woman and I kissed her. The Prophet's immediate thing is make your prayers very strong. Focus very much. Day, night, throughout the parts of the night. Because it is good that wipes away bad. This is a reminder for the mindful. You're human, you will make mistakes. And whenever you do that, bounce back very, very strongly. And in fact, Ibn Atayl al Iskandariya said, sometimes, Ibn al Qayyim al Jawziya said this as well. He said, sometimes a servant commits a sin. And because of that sin, he is so racked by guilt, so overcome by remorse. He turns to Allah and he weeps and weeps. And he stands to worship Allah and he, uh, uh, during the night. And he fasts and he gives sadaqah. And he begs of his Lord for forgiveness. And because of that sin, he achieves through the 
the, his attempts to compensate. Such a standing with Allah that he could never have achieved had he not fallen into that sin in the first place. And Ibn Atayla said, he said, uh, So many a sin which caused you to then become humble and, uh, and enter into a state of humility. So many a sin which brings about a state of humbleness and dejectedness and humility is better than many a good deed which creates inside you arrogance and pomp. MashaAllah, I've done five hajjis now. Alhamdulillah. You know, all of he said, but a man who's really sin, he's got his head down. And that could be more beloved to Allah than... Now that's not to say do lots of sins, everybody. No. Because the one who does a sin and considers it not to be a sin, that is coming to the very brink of Iman and Kufr. The Prophet of Allah said, Kullu ummati mu'afa illa al-mujahireen. All of my ummah will be forgiven, my Lord told me, except those who flaunt it. Do you know what that means? Those who, 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 who show it off. Those who are happy about it. They're so relaxed. They're so chilled. They say, so, yeah, look what I'm doing today. And the Prophet of Allah said, a man spends the night in sin and Allah mercifully covered it so that nobody knew about it. But guess what he did in the morning? He said, hey, do you know what I did? Got up to last night. And he tears open the veil that Allah had graciously draped over him. That is the ultimate. Don't do that. Don't be proud of a bad thing. We're human. We will do bad things. We'll make mistakes. But then have the humility to recognize this is not a thing to be proud of. And I beg from my Lord. And I recognize a bad for a bad. And that's why lots of the scholars would teach a dua. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqan wa rizuqna tiba'a. Allah show, allow us to see truth as truth and to follow it. Wa arina al-batila batilan wa rizuqna jtinaabah. And show us falsehood as falsehood and allow us to save ourselves from it. In speaking and concluding really this discussion about interaction, a healthy society requires a really healthy balance in the way that men and women can work amongst themselves. Unless you can, people say men are from Mars, women are from Venus. So unless we're going to wholesale, uh, you know, deport all of the men to one place and all of the women to another place, which is not going to happen, we're going to have to learn and develop within ourselves the mechanisms for being able to interact because we're going to see each other and do that recognizing one another as your, this is your sister, this is your mother, this is your daughter. And for the sisters, this is your brother, this is like your uncle, like your father, like your... And this is an important thing to build. And that is very difficult to maintain where you have a complete... Now, where Allah Azza wa Jalla and His Messenger, they used to say, مَا لَمْ يَكُنْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ دِينًا فَلَنْ يَكُونَ الْيَوْمَ الدِّينَ that which was not deen at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it was not an obligation then, it's not an obligation today. At the time of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if it was permissible for men and women to occupy the same space, if it was permissible for men and women to buy and sell. I was mentioning Hidayah. al marghinani says it's permissible for a man, it is not permissible for a man to look towards a female. With the exception of her face, her hands, and Abu Hanifa also said her feet. Abu Yusuf said up to the elbows as well because women by necessity when they're working, when they're taking water from the wells, when they're in the fields, when they're buying and selling will, may often have their um, forearms uh, uh, uncovered. And so the scholars, Abu Yusuf, the student, the Qadi of Qudat, the chief justice of the Muslim world, and one of the foremost of the students of Abu Hanifa, he included the dhira'in, this part, the uh, up to the elbows, uh, as also being permissible for a man to see and therefore for a female to keep uncovered because there is a need for that. That's not to say that people should uh, voluntarily or women should voluntarily go about with parts of their body uncovered where there isn't a need. But he's speaking about that. And then he says, and for the face too, and this is an interesting thing, he says, because... It is, there is a haja for men and women to interact. Bay'an wa shira'an akhdan wa ata'an. For men and women, we live in this, we make up the same community. We will buy and sell. We will give and take. We have to know one another. 
When the Prophet وسلم, was in the masjid, Bilal came and said, Ya Rasulullah, somebody came. He said, who came? Bilal was able to say, so-and-so's wife and so-and-so's wife. The community knew one another. And in knowing one another, there is a protection for the community. If your daughter, if your young grow up in this community and everybody knows them and they know everybody, then it's, it's, it's protection. If our boys grow up and all of the women are their aunties, then you can't get away with you know, just going to another street and, and, and be a bit of a gangster uh, and then come back onto Cromwell Road. And you, because every, there's still your uncles and aunts everywhere. There is protection in this. So Imam, so this is Al-Marqinani's quotes in Hidayah, that it's permissible for the face to be uncovered because men and women will buy and sell, will have to have interaction through which they can know one another. And so coming to the question of, uh, but there is a middle ground. And that is why the Prophet of Allah Wasallam he said that the women will make salah, the children, the men, let the women leave first so that the men aren't and the women aren't jostling together as they're trying to leave. There's maintaining a respectful, dignified space. Uh, and so he didn't normally like to delegate these things to screens and curtains. He liked to, to develop these things in human beings. And that is part of the wisdom of the Prophet Wasallam. He taught people how they, they, how they should speak to one another. The Qur'an says to the wives of the Prophet Wasallam to speak to them. And the wives of the Prophet Wasallam says, Ya Nisa and Nabi, lastunnaka ahadim minan nisa. Women, O oh, wives of the Prophet, you are not the same as other women. So they did indeed have a special set of, 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 of uh, rules. And one of those is that if they had to then observe the veil, and the women of and the Allah Azza wa Jal gives the reason for this because if any man should see them and feel in his heart anything wrong, anything inappropriate, then that is destruction for him. Because this is your mother. This is your mother. Allah says, Wa azwajuhu ummahatukum. His wives are your mothers. And so the Allah Azza wa Jal says to the wives of the Prophet, if they ask you anything, let it be min wa ra'i hijab from behind a screen. And that's the one place that we have this here. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, and if they ask you a question, reply to them, but don't soften your voices. Try to keep it, uh, don't lower your voices or soften them uh, any more than is necessary. Lest one who has sickness, disease in his heart, begin to desire. Don't allow any opportunity for that. And that is a general teaching for all of us. We interact with one another as for the sake of, 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 of necessity, for the sake of growth, for the sake of achieving good things, for the sake of inclusivity, not because we're interested in other things. And yet the Qur'an takes into account that men and women will be interested in one another as well. And taking that into account, Allah Azza wa Jal says to men in the Qur'an in Surah uh, Al-Imran, if you alim Allahu annakum satadkurunahunna, God knows that you will think about them, about who, about women. Alim Allahu annakum satadkurunahunna, walakin la tuwaiduhunna sirran illa an taqulu qawla ma'arufa. But don't make secret agreements with them. Don't ask for each other that your phone numbers. Don't start, you know, sort of talking and communicating in places where nobody else is around. Because this is bad. You're permitted to say something good. What does something good mean? If you look in the books of Tafsir, the scholars have said it's permissible to say, I'm looking to get married to somebody of these uh, qualities. Or if you're considering to get married, then I, uh, I hope that I can speak to your wali and things like that. So that's, that's permissible. What's not permissible is to start flirting, flirtatious talk, uh, and things like this. These, anything that you don't like for your sister, you don't do for anybody else's sister. Anything that you wouldn't like for your son, if you're a woman, you know, you wouldn't like for your brother, then you don't do that to, to another person. We remember that ultimately we have Allah Azza wa Jal is with us at all times. And so there is a thing. Now, this means we can talk, we can work in, in, in an open environment. We can't have khalwa. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, never is a male and a female, or a male and a female alone, إِلَّا وَثَالِثُ إِلَّا وَالشَّيْطَانُ ثَالِثُهُمَا 
except shaitan is there as the third. A boy and a girl are together and they're not related and they're not halal for each other. Shaitan is the third. So that is something that we have to be very careful about. Not to allow a situation of khalwa. Not to allow a place where two people are alone because then bad things can take over. And very, very good and righteous and upright and upstanding. And don't have such confidence in yourself that you think shaitan is, is, is not you know, going to be able to uh, create a problem for you here. So that's important. And the last thing that I'd say is this interaction has to is for a purpose. It's for the purpose of giving growth. We all have children we, and we desire that in another 10, 15, 20 years, your children will be filling up these masjids. And we have at the moment in the UK, alhamdulillah, we have large masjid. Just Peter alone, huge mosques since I was here. Very, very big masjid. Beautiful things, multi-million pound affairs amazing you know things that have been achieved now go and look at some of the cathedrals in this country and the great churches and those were built up hundreds of years ago and they are enormous and before we had any of the engineering and any of the technology the machinery that we have today these in huge gigantic edifices were created a labor of love each brick each stone put in place by hand by communities paid for by a very, very poor community. Today they stand empty, most of them. They're empty except for on certain days and even then a small number of people. If we don't want the same to happen to our masajid, to our Muslim community, we don't want to lose our souls, then it's really important that we... You don't feed your sons more than your daughters. They both need to eat and they need the same amount of food roughly on their plate. You don't give your sons beds and expect your daughters to sleep in the cellar. You know that you wouldn't. That you, they both need these things. That they both need clothing. Both need spiritual provision. And this is why the masjid has to be a place that is accessible and that is inclusive. And our, if our dean has not prohibited something, if it's not prohibited men and women teachers, for example, to attend a training, to attend a class, then that is halal and this is a, a basic usul or qaida of our deen aslu kulli shay al ibaha all things are halal until and unless they have been made haram innocent until proven guilty halal until proven haram if you're walking down the street and you need to make salah and you think oh it's time for salah let me make salah according to the sharia you look at the ground you don't have a prayer mat, you're not required to carry a prayer mat all the time. And you say, Allah Akbar, and you can pray on the pavement. Now you may think, well, I know for a fact, people walk these streets sometimes with dogs. Men um, walk around with cans of beer in their hands, or, or people with bottles and things. And, and I've even sometimes seen the odd drunk person, you know, urinating on the street. So how can, well, and maybe, maybe, if you sent, if you took out, and it took a small sample of, of, of um, any of the pavement, sent it in for forensic analysis. You'd find every single type of traces of najasa that you can imagine. But the Sharia says, right now, can you see najasa? You can't. You can't physically make out anything that is definitely najasa. Then the assumption of purity takes over and you pray. The Sahaba prayed. There were cats and there were dogs. There were donkeys and there were cows. There are far more animals than there are today because we have cars, whereas they... Their lives result, revolved around uh, animals and their livelihoods. And so there are, there are cows and there are camels and there are donkeys and there are horses and there are cats and there are dogs. But when the time for Salah came, nobody said, how many dogs, cats and other such things have been here? It doesn't look dirty. Allahu Akbar, you pray. The assumption is, is, is always positive. We're not a people who become filled with waswasa and then you be, it becomes impossible for you to do anything in life. So that's negative. That's, that's from shaitan. Waswasa is from shaitan. And similarly, if Islam has, Islam has at no point said, in fact, the, the, most of the scholars have completely agree, agreed from classical times, the voice of a woman is not awra. The voice of a woman is not awra. Most of the madhahib are in agreement about this. We have some minority views to the contrary, but the voice of a woman, infant, including in the Hanafi madhab, is not awra. And the proof of this is that the Sahaba related hadith from women, 
from the wives of the Prophet وسلم, from the sister-in-law of the Prophet وسلم, Asma bint Abi Bakr, she relates hadith. There is not a single hadith scholar in our history, except if you look in the biographies of the teachers, they all had something called tabaqat, where they note down all of their teachers from whom they took hadith. You'll find a, 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 a significant number of women in those things. Imam Tirmidhi took hadith from women. Imam Muslim took hadith from Imam Abu Dawood. Imam, many of them hadith scholars of the past. So they took hadith from men and from women. There are women who would teach hadith in the masajid and men would uh, attend those classes and take hadith from them. So Islam has not made something impossible. Now, we also, obviously, we, th there's a struggle between Islam and our world. And as a result of that struggle, there's a tension and a lot of Muslims do have a slightly, slight sort of, ooh, have a slight split personality syndrome when it comes to these things. And I'll give you an example of this. You go to school, college, university, you go shopping, you pop into your local supermarket, you get on the bus, and there are members of the opposite gender all, all around, and you carry on, that's fine. But you walk into a mosque, and suddenly people become hypersensitive. Something that has Islamic over it, and it becomes now, Astaghfirullah, brother, I can still see that sister. I was seeing her outside, it's fine. But now we've walked in here, and what's going on? And a good friend of mine told me once, he was in a masjid in, in a small town, and it was like a summer day, and he's, he's someone famous. I'm not going to take his name because you're recording this. Um, and, but he's well known to you. So he said it was a long summer's day, and he'd just stop in, in, in this masjid to make salah. And he, he makes his salah. The whole mosque is empty because there's you know, a long time between Asr and Maghrib. So summer is that, that kind of part of the time, uh, year. So he's come in, and he's made his Asr salah himself, or Dhuhr salah, whichever it was. And there's only the caretaker of the masjid. He's also in the corner there doing something. And then a brother walks in, like an Arab brother's walked in, and he's got his wife. And they're travelers too, and, and, and they saw the masjid, and they wanted to make salah, because Allah made it a fard for both men and women at an equal level. And so they walk in, and uh, the caretaker says, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, brother, you can't, your, your wife cannot come here. There's no space for, for women in this masjid. But she just needs to make salah, brother. He says, no, no, but you can't come in. It's there's only him. In the masjid anyway. And he says, no, no, no. Well, the, the brother just says, tells his wife, come, let's just do it quickly. And they, in spite of his protestations, his protests, they, they do their salah and then they leave. My friend observes this. He, he wants to have a word with the, ima, uh, with the caretaker. He thinks, well, there's no point. The caretaker's left. He walks into uh, a convenience store, like a grocery store, just opposite the mosque. And he's uh, there to buy a sandwich and a drink and crisps and the caretaker walks into the shop as well and this time the caretaker says to he's walked in and he's as soon as he walks in he's he's got his shopping and he says to the girl behind the till hello my dear how are you how is everything it's a completely different person he was having a meltdown at the very presence of a woman in hijab standing behind her husband who just wanted three four minutes of time to make her fart behind her husband Oh, like her present. But when he goes out, he's a completely different person. How are you, my dear? Are you okay? Very good. Nice. Can we... So what's going on? Split personality syndrome. Hypersensitive in one context, but outside the masjid, everything's halal. This is unhealthy. Islam is exactly the same in the marketplace as it is in the masjid. You have no special requirements here. You have no special concessions out there. It's not more strict here, it's not more loose there. It is exactly the same. But because we don't have that in the masjid, we don't have any way of developing this. And so in the mosque, it's very sensitive. Outside the mosque, our community gets up to far too much. Far too much. How do we come back from that situation where boys and girls are far too familiar with one another? Forget young people, older people at weddings. What do our weddings look like? People feeding cake to the bride and on stage doing a, a, some attempt of a dance or you know all these kind of things going on. What's happening there? It's because that's, Allah's not watching there. Allah's too busy looking in the masjid, making sure there's no women coming inside the masjid. No. Same Allah is everywhere. In the masjid, in a wedding, in the marketplace, in school, college, university, on the bus, in Peterborough, in a place where nobody knows you, 
Wherever you go, Allah is your companion. And the same rules apply. And this is why it's important that we have these things in the masjid. And it's fine for men and women to be in attendance. Our religion encourages that. It encourages that women are not deprived of that opportunity. Um, and speaking and interacting within the bounds of all of these things is not only permissible, it's necessary. It's important. And if we don't do that, what to, one of two very bad things can happen. Either our women, our young, our girls become so disconnected from the mosques that this isn't a place for them. Or they become so disgruntled, they start calling for women-only mosques. That's starting to happen now. We want, there are places where they, people are insisting on men and women praying side by side. And the imam can be, be a woman or a man. And so there's a whole bunch of other crazy stuff going on. Islam will always be the balance, the voice of, of sanity, of reason, of balance in between both extremes. So let's not occupy any one extreme. Our culture does not dictate our deen. It's fine to be Bang Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Mirpuri and Afghani. It's fine to be all of those things. But our deen is, is, is a deen for all of the world. And you have to remember one more thing. Something that worked fantastically in the village of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh may not necessarily work great here. When we decided at some point, or our parents or maybe even grandparents decided that they were going to settle in the UK or wherever it is, um, it's not just the climate that's different. It's not just that we, we had a lot of sun back in... Pakistan and, and lots of rain and, 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 and drizzle here. But there are other differences and we have to accommodate those things. And our deen is flexible enough to, the question is, are we flexible enough to? And if we're not, if we want to somehow hold on to something that may have worked to an extent in the subcontinent and think that's going to continue working here when the reality has changed. Here your daughters are in school, college, university, getting employment uh, out there in, 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 in the world. But you're cultural Islamic identity is going to be very much built around the model in Pakistan where women didn't come out of the homes, they stayed within, their, within the homes. The men went to the marketplaces, the men went to work, the men did all of these things. And so, in a sense, women weren't out of doors. Now we, don't, we need to involve and, and make sure things are fulfilling and satisfying because otherwise everything else will be available but this one place won't. We don't wear the same, uh, you know, back in Pakistan, it's, it's hot in Bangladesh when the weather's hot. You wear one type of clothing. When you come to the UK, it's freezing cold. You have to wear a, a heavy coat and heavy shoes. We adapt. Our deen needs to also... This isn't about modernizing our deen. Really, it's about traditionalizing our deen. Because I'm not promoting or suggesting anything which the Prophet of Allah was not doing. This is something he was doing. His masjid was like this. It's been a few centuries that people let culture take over the land, the, the shape, the, 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 the experiences. Uh, but we need to be able to include. Inshallah, I'm going to stop at this point because I think I've covered most of the things I wanted to. We'll have a bit of time for questions now, if people have. Can I just see a quick show of hands if you have any questions? Because if not, then we can start wrapping things up, inshallah. So if anyone has a question they'd like to ask, brothers or sisters, you can raise your hand. So there's one here. Okay. Anybody else who has one, you've got a few minutes. Then I'll start with you, brother. Um, you know, you mentioned about the place being permissible. Yeah. Um, obviously, we see reports on the news, etc. about the niqab being an issue. Uh-huh. Um, what, in your opinion, what would your take be on women actually wearing niqab? You see, the, the niqab is, it's a personal choice, it's a personal right, and I don't like the idea of dictating to women that they can and can't wear something. We don't, this isn't France, alhamdulillah. This isn't a place where the state has any business um, deciding what is and isn't acceptable. Everything else is acceptable. You're allowed to wear the shortest of skirts and and. and however many face rings and tattoos, whatever you want, you can wear. The one thing you, that offends the society, the sensibilities of society, is if a woman decides she wants to cover her face. That's a nonsense, it's discrimination and it's wrong. On the other hand, uh, is it an obligation? It's not an obligation. According to the Hanafi madhab, the, the, the truth of the matter is it's not an obligation. And 
according to a uh, number of the other schools as well, it's it's not an obligation. There are positions among some of the scholars who consider it a wajib. The truth is that the Sahabiyat at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu amongst them were women who covered their face, amongst them there were women who did not cover their face. And, um, you know, and, and, and that therefore it can't be an obligation if the Prophet Sallallahu is not telling the women who don't cover, you must cover your face. Because anything that happens in his presence, <coughs> which he does not express disapproval for, must be permissible. That is from the Usul of Sunnah. So I don't consider it an obligation. At the same time, I don't like the idea of the state or the media de bullying women who have chosen that for themselves. Um, and I th it's a choice. It's a choice for women to do. You know, my preference isn't really relevant because I, it's not about me. I'm never going to be the one to decide should I wear it or should I not wear it. I don't have to wear it, you know. Um, so the one who has to, that is the, 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 the woman involved, the woman, the sister, it's for them to decide. If they want to wear it, they can wear it. If they don't want to, they don't have to. But women should know that it's not an obligation. If, anyone, if a woman wears it because she's been advised this is required of you, then that is also a, an injustice, a wrong that's been done to her. For had she been told, actually it's not a requirement, Allah Azza wa Jal does not hold you sinful if you don't do this, then would she still choose to do it? If she still does, that's her choice. That's her now truly exercising her own sovereignty to decide, her own volition. But if it's, um, if it's a case of, you know, she's kind of been almost emotionally blackmailed into doing it. Oh, you have to, it's a fard, it's a, it's, it's a wajib. Without it, you're, you're sinful. Any man who looks at your face, you're sinful for that. No, you're not. If that were true, then the Prophet of Allah would never have left the women who kept their faces uncovered, uh, would have allowed them to do that. So we can't make stuff up. Maybe one would prefer his own wife uh, to cover her face, but you can't make stuff up for that reason. So women should be told, and then it's up to them to decide. Yes, Sheikh. Brother, you talk about um, uh, niqab and veil for the women. Mm. Uh, one thing I would like to hear, particularly with the males present here, is the modesty mm. of the man, uh, particularly not just visual to the women, uh, but also in their own privacies, uh, internet, mm. televisions. What is the Quranic teaching? Well, the it's, for the men mm. eyes, because often we talk about women. That's so very true. Very, very, very valid point. And, and we're sort of out of time, and I was mainly focusing on interactions, but that is a whole other area that needs to be explored in detail. The Quran, when it speaks about hijab, it begins with the hijab of men. <laughs> Say to men to lower their gaze to protect their chastity, to guard their chastity. This is better for them and more pure. And then Allah says, and tell the women believers to guard, lower their gaze, to guard their chastity. So this is absolutely, absolutely important. <coughs> Hijab for men and for women is about modesty. And in other words, it's and the word hijab physically means a screen but it means to be in a state of haya and the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a hadith says inna mimma adraka nas min kalamin nubuwatil ula from the very first words of prophethood that humanity received are these idha lam tastahi fasna'a ma shi'ta if you feel no shame if you've become basharam bakhirat if you feel no shame then do as you please because there's no difference between you and a lesser creature now. So modesty is defines uh, the, 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 the dignity of the human being. Boy, girl, male, female. And that means we have to be bashful. Don't, and I've said this before, don't speak to, don't behave in the presence of uh, women in the way that you would not be happy if someone behaved in front of your sister. Whether that's, you know, sort of, trying to act in a certain way or speak in a certain way or none of that you wouldn't like it for your sister and the, the sahabi a, a man came to the prophet and said ya rasul i'd like permission for zina and the sahaba wanted to beat him 
And the Prophet ﷺ just said to them, stop, let me ask you. And he said to him, tell me, would you, would you uh, approve of someone asking that for your mother? He said, by Allah, never. By your daughter, your sister, your aunt. He said, by Allah, never. Then the Prophet ﷺ said, and similarly, people don't want this for their sisters, their mothers, their daughters, their aunts. And then he placed his hand on his chest. He made a dua for him for purity. And the Sahaba said, from that day, this man was, he, he never, uh, nothing was more horrendous to him than, than zina. So there is a way of engaging. Now, dress, you know, clothing. Boys are wearing tight clothing, let alone girls. And something about the people, think about it. Who, who designs your clothing? It's designed often by people of dubious um, sexual proclivities, should we say. Um, in, in, in different parts of the world and, and so clothing which was at one time designed to cover your Allah the first thing he says in that ayah I mentioned قَدْ أَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ لِبَاسٍ يُوَارِي سَوْآتِكُمْ we have sent down to you clothing to cover your nakedness now the clothing accentuates and describes the nakedness or makes it more tantalizing because it's out of sight but it's almost kind of and that's, that's, that's not the, that's the complete diametric opposite to the fundamental purpose the function of clothing clothing is haya you're beautiful everyone gets it now you don't need to that doesn't need to be displayed it doesn't need to be uh it's not for everybody else and the same and this applies to boys and girls now it's hard to find jeans for boys which aren't skinny boys and girls both you don't need to wear skinnies really it's not if something's describing the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi he turned his face away when he saw somebody wearing light clothing and he said that the clothing of a woman should not describe her bones. This is hadith, sahih. And the same thing applies to boys. Boys, very rarely in history uh, was that the fashion, but today it is the fashion. And so we have to be careful about these things, things which accentuate parts of our body for a purpose. And we know what that purpose is, and so we should try to guard against that it is perfectly possible guys i say this to both the ladies and the gents it's perfectly possible today to dress in a stylish fashionable good way a nice way without having to show off parts of your body it's it's a, you're able to do that so don't opt for something which really doesn't add much to you your quality of life isn't improved because someone's looking at you and thinking what, how nice your body looks. Your life isn't improved by that, but you have more to answer to Allah for on the last day. Why add to that? You step out of your house, it's been one hour. In that one hour, every human being that you've walked past and they've seen something, and then, you know, why, why have that burden? So those are things that we need to address. And as I say, this is actually a separate topic and one that is very important. The hijab of boys and of girls, of men and of women. The modesty that should that is, is an obligation that we keep to is something that needs exploring. Do we have any other questions? Yes. Any questions from the sisters? No? Okay. Sheikh Sal, you talked about um, the cultural balances, especially in, in Burkhat. Yeah. Or the subcontinent. So... What we found, what we find in this day and age, and especially our forefathers and so on, they've lived in extended families where brothers live together and their mm. wives live together. Yeah, yeah. Can you just um, elaborate? So that's a really that? good example, actually. Some people think that this is un-Islamic. Historically, this was a norm. The Prophet of Allah and Islam is not, it's not against the idea of families and extended families having a relationship with one another. That's halal to do. How many of you are familiar with the story? It's a hadith sahih. It's in Bukhari. When a man comes to the Prophet and says, Ya Rasulullah, I'm, I'm, I'm needy. Can you provide something? And the Prophet asks his wife and all of them say, we have nothing at home. Then the Prophet asks in the masjid and says, will anyone host this person and uh, take this person as my guest and a sahabi says i will ya rasulullah and he takes him home and he hasn't even checked with his wife he's just volunteered he runs home to his wife and he says is there any food and she says there's a little something which i've kept for the children nothing else you're all familiar with the story right where he puts the light out the husband and the wife they eat it they make chomping sounds in the dark and the guest 
eats the little food there is the children have been put to sleep and so the entire family's gone hungry just to feed the guest of the rasulullah of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam the next morning when he comes to the masjid the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam says allah was so pleased with the your the way you hosted your guest last night and so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam knew about it allah had sent jibril to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to tell him how pleased he was about this what a lot of people don't really think about is the fact that he had the husband and the wife are entertaining this guest together and the husband is saying to the wife when you bring the food <coughs> pretend to fix the lamp and then turn it out so we're in darkness and then you and I will make noises like we are eating to allow him to now this person is not a mahram he's not a you know he's not it's and imam malik is is clear about this that it's permissible for a wife in the presence of her husband to entertain other people to bring the food they can families can eat together that's permissible to do so if two brothers live in the family home and they're both married and their wives what there are things that we have to not do there is hijab so you observe that so that means they should always have their chadar or their head scarf whatever to hand so if if their brother in law walks in then it can go over the head so that the part of the body is covered sufficiently and there is an uh, the absence of being in an intimate in situation that is khalwa being alone with the brother in law that clearly and the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said iyakum wad dukhul ala nisa beware of coming to women entering upon women when they're not with their husbands imam bukhari he mentions this hadith and this is where somebody said afrait al hamwa ya rasulullah what about the brother in law he said al hamul maut that is death so a lot of people take this and say therefore you can't have the brother in law must never see his bhabhi or his sister in law or you know well imam bukhari brings his hadith under the chapter heading ad-dukhul ala al-mughibat entering upon women who are on their own it's about being in uh isolation being alone with women and that's what the prophet saying don't come to women who are on their own and sit with them and talk to them and somebody said what about the in-laws you know brother in law because that you might live in the same house he said that's death because you're very close and the opportunity so don't be like that on your own but where there's other people around your mother's there your brother's there her husband etc etc then it's permi- completely permissible and uh, and the hadith is absolutely about women when they're alone they should not be alone with a man apart from the husband or the mahram husband or mahram did you know that husband and mahram are two different things did you know that yeah some of you will like this, this who's her mahram the husband the husband is not mahram the husband is halal mahram means prohibited so the father the brother the son the nephew the these are such such close relationships it's prohibited for marriage to take place between these two whereas the husband of course it's you know it's halal so the husband or the mahram the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in a hadith that's related by imam al-bukhari three things about women he said la yahilu limra'atin tu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir an tusafir masirata yawmin wa laylatin illa wa ma'aha dhu rahm min mahram minha aw zawjha it's not permissible for a woman who believes in god on the last day to travel for a day and a night except accompanied by her mahram or her husband and then he said he relaxed it and the second hadith is also in bukhari two days and two nights and then he relaxed it more and said three days and three nights and scholars have explained the reason he re- the, uh, for the for the extended concession is because as the environment became more secure safety and uh, stability and peace uh, were established the permission was extended and so it is permissible for a woman to travel for up to 3 days and 3 nights um but not or or it's not permissible for a woman to travel for 3 days and 3 nights unaccompanied by a mahram but beneath that it is permissible inshallah are we good yes zahur bhai mawlana is there a um, a counter argument mm. to the i would say prohibition but discouragement Sahaba very good thank you very much zakallah khair i should have probably touched on this because people you might go where and read ah but aisha radhiyallahu anha said 
لو أدرك النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم أحدث النساء من بعد لمنعهن المسجد كما منعت نساء بني إسرائيل. If the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم saw what the women have got up to today, he would have forbidden them from coming to the masjid just as the women of Bani Israel were forbidden from coming to the masjid. And based on that, some scholars, and we're talking very late midi uh, fuqaha, Imam Abu Hanifa is completely on record. He said it's permissible for women to come to the masjid. He said the nighttime prayers um, young women should not come to because it's not very safe in the dark. You know, they didn't have lamps, they didn't have lighting, and anything could happen. And, and, and this is obviously a time when, uh, as Islam grows outside of Medina, Al Munawwara, and Skontak, there are places where you know, the, the, the moral condition of the community and there are thieves and bandits and all this type of thing, right? So it's not always very secure. So, but Imam Abu Hanifa said daytime prayers is permissible. Nighttime prayers, young women should not come to. But Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, it is related from her. One time she's made this statement and some people have taken that very literally. Now, here's the problem with taking this literally. The problem is not a single one of the a'imma took that hadith, the early a'imma, took that statement of Aisha's and said, therefore, women no longer allowed. The Prophet's masjid, uh, Masjid al-Nabawi, ala sahibiha salatu was salam, and other masajid, they continue to, to, to be accessible to both men and women. Because most, scholars, most people from her time onwards understood this not to be a fatwa, but to be a reprimand, a telling off. She's, say, she's seeing something that she disproves of, and she's saying, what's wrong with you? If the Prophet had seen people like you, then he would have stopped women from coming to the masjid. It's a telling off. How do we know it's not a fatwa? Well, although it's true that the changes that occurred after his lifetime, the Prophet ﷺ was not there to see, he nonetheless knew of what was to come because he informed us of it himself. He said in authentic hadith, again in the Sihah, Sinfani min ahli nar lam arahuma. There are two types of the people of hellfire that I've not yet seen. It's not happened yet, but it will one day happen. When it happens, this will be two very bad things. And he mentions men, and then he mentions women. In, men in talking of men, he speaks of qawm ma'ahum siyat ka al baqar yadribuna biha nas. There will be men who walk around with whips with which they strike people, lash people. They're tyrants. They're oppressors. So that's the men. Men abusing uh, what they have, which is strength. And then he talks about women. And there'll be women who will be dressed and in spite of that undressed. Clothed yet naked. Drawing others towards them, inclining towards others. With heads like the humps of, of, of camels. They will not enter paradise or even smell its fragrance, and its fragrance can be smelled from great distances. Now, here the Prophet speaks of men and of women, both of whom abuse their capital, their assets. What are the assets of men? His strength. He abuses that by physically abusing others and 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 uh, beating others. And a woman abuses the beauty that Allah has given to her to to launch an offensive on uh, on society in that way. So both of these things are happening. He says, "I haven't seen this, but it's going to happen." So he, although Aisha says, "If the Prophet saw what you women were up to today." We can say the Prophet indeed وسلم, knew of it in spite of not seeing it. And yet, the only advice that he gives in relation to women in the mosque is لا تمنعوا إما الله مساجد الله Don't prevent it. Don't prevent women from coming to Allah's houses. Because if you do, where will they go? What's going to be left for them? What's going to give them their deen? And some of the scholars in the, at, at a different point, as I've said, Islam spread and it's gone through eras, areas. There was a time when people said men and women don't interact in society. In Khurasan, in parts of Afghanistan, in many of these places, they don't interact in Balkh. Very segregated world. That was their world pre-Islamically, let alone post-Islamically. So they said men and women, they don't interact. It's a matter of honor, matter of izzat. 
Therefore, we're not going to allow the mosque to be open, accessible, because in a community where you've never seen the opposite gender, and you're suddenly faced with one another, people are going to, that's, 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 that's really, you know, it's a big shock to the system. And overly segregating often has the opposite effect of creating undue chemistry. Do you understand that? When you overly segregate something, then you, you have the, inadvertently, you, you charge up the environment. So that the first time one sees somebody from the opposite gender, there's, there's you know, lots of things going on inside the head. And uh, whereas in, in, a, in a very organic environment, it's perfectly po possible for a person to go about their daily lives and there's whatever's happening around them without being hugely uh, influenced by these things. So what he said was, um, uh, so in, in this situation where men and women are not interacting in society, there's, it's a very segregated society, they said we will, not allow, we will not let women come to the mosque because this will bring women out of the homes, number one. And it will cause, uh, introduce men and women to one another when they have otherwise no other opportunity to do that. So that was the specific position that Fuqaha did indeed adopt, but in view of these, this, this set of circumstances. Today, allowing women access to the mosque is not encouraging them to come out of the home because they're already out of the home. And anyone who spends all of their time inside the home, then no one's knocking on their door doing jola and saying, can the sister please come? Alhamdulillah, they're, they're there. They're, no one's asking. But it's a facility for everyone who is out and about in order to ensure that they don't have access to everything except the one thing that is spiritually uh, fulfilling to them. And also, uh, one of the ulama that I was in discussion with about this said that there was a time when allowing women to come to the mosque introduced intermingling. The fear was it would introduce intermingling between the genders and society was not... In, was not was very segregated. Today, bringing women to the mosque in a world where people intermingle all day long can have the effect, the, the one chance we have of teaching the Islamic adab and therefore lessening the effects of intermingling. Does that make sense? How do we resolve the problem that men and women, with or without the mosque doors being open, men and women are going to interact. Boys and girls are going to interact. They're going to at school, at college, on the bus, in town. It's going to happen. Keeping the mosque accessible to both means that there's some consciousness of Allah. There's some teachings of, and things that people, young people and older people can take away and then be mindful of in all of their, the, the different areas of life. And inshallah that goes with them. So it's necessary today. And therefore we have the example of the Prophet ﷺ that we go back to. That example, the example of the Prophet's mosque, was one that is, and that's what I mean when I say that the sunnah, in everything else we look for the sunnah, but when it comes to looking at the masjid, most of us don't take into consideration what the Prophet's masjid was organized as. Yes, sure. Last, last couple, inshallah. Yeah. You mentioned uh, that uh, in the Prophet's time, the man used to stand in front of the Jamaat and the Prophet used to stand in front of the Fixed time of the ladies and men and children were praying at that time, but now they maybe I might be a little late when the prayer is started. Yeah. So if the ladies are been subdued and the man comes. I mean, it depends on where the entrance is, and so. So obviously, yeah. it's better in a sense that maybe. And as I said, I'm not saying that you should have the women in this place. Every place has to, everyone has to take into account your own situations, the logistics, the things on the ground, and then work out what works best. What I'm not saying is, please, can you have from the next salat the women here, the brothers? But what I wanted to focus on is that this is how the Prophet ﷺ did it, and what was the hikmah? that he was achieving through that. And therefore, regardless of how you offer the salah, have the women upstairs, have the brothers downstairs, alhamdulillah, no problem. But don't consider it haram or un-Islamic should there be an event where men and women can occupy the same space. I'll tell you something interesting. I often go to universities to do courses and classes and stuff. 
And um, and often you'll have the boys on this side, the girls on that side, or or sometimes the girls in the back, the boys at the front, and I'm giving a class. And so one of the students said, oh, I can't come to your class, I'm sorry, because it's not segregated. I said, okay, well, that's your choice, alhamdulillah, if you, you don't have to come. It's something that's happening. So I said, what are you doing, by the way? He said, oh, I'm, I'm studying whatever he was studying. I said, and, and do you attend those lectures? Yes, I do. And how are those lectures? Oh, you know. Who sits next to you there? No, the sisters, the girls. So that's okay for you to do. But that's dunya. So you have a special fiqh for your dunya, where everything becomes halal. But when it comes to deen, then what Allah made halal is not good enough for you. That is my point. Allah hasn't made it haram. Don't make it haram. Because what you end up doing in trying to be overly precautious, like the Christians and the monasticism, intentions may be very, very good intentions. But the results can be less than good, not what was expected. So keeping in mind clearly what the distinction, no problem with the sisters at the top, the brothers downstairs. The problem is in thinking in our head that anything other than this is haram. And if there is a need and we have them all occupying, uh, accommodated in the same place, that we're doing something un-Islamic, that is a problem. Okay? Jazakallah khairan. Thank you then, everybody. Oh, sorry. Okay, final. This is the last one, inshallah. Can you just uh, touch on the hadith that is you know, related by some people who say that the uh, Prophet said is women's salah is better at home? Yes, indeed. Absolutely. The hadith of Umm Habiba that the Prophet wasallam said, and it's mentioned also by Umm Salama and others, he said, لا تمنع إماء الله مساجد الله وبيوتهن خير لهن. Don't prohibit women from coming to the houses of Allah, although their homes are better for them. And based on this, many of the scholars have said the um, virtue of a man, sorry, the virtue of jama'ah to pray at home, you receive one salah's worth. To pray in congregation in the masjid, 25 times more, 27 times more. A woman praying at home is not deprived of this. So when she prays at home, she's still receiving the same reward she would receive in jama'ah. Because Allah Azza wa has not required of her to come. She may have to look after the children. She may have other duties. But if she does come, does that mean now it's less reward? No. Why do we know it's not less? Because then the Prophet's wives, Azwajun Nabi al Mutaharat, radiallahu anhunna, why would they bother coming into the masjid to pray with the Prophet of Allah وسلم, if they're getting a reduction in reward? They'd continue being in their hujra, but they would come. Umar ibn al Khattab, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know that he was martyred, shaheed, leading the Fajr prayer. He was leading the Fajr prayer, Abu Lu'lu'a came and stabbed him in the side you know about this and then to get out and the sahaba made such suffs such close rows to be able to get out to make his escape he had to stab a number of other people and then they still grabbed him in the end his wife Atika bin Sa'id was in the masjid the day that he was um, some people say Umar stopped have you ever heard this Umar stopped women coming to the mosque women used to come to the mosque in the time of the Prophet but Umar stopped this happening have you ever heard this it's wrong when did he stop it? His wife is in the masjid the day he's stabbed. So when did he stop it? He came back from the grave to say, by the way, can you stop? No. He, until his dying day, his wife was in the masjid. Ibn Hajr al-Asqalani in Fath al-Bari relates, Atika bin Sa'id was a very beautiful woman. Umar al-Khattab had a great degree of ghayrah. You know, he was, he was very protective and, and quite a large degree of healthy jealousy, if you like. So he was never, he said to her one time, why do you go to the masjid? You know I don't like it. She said, all you have to do is tell me not to go. All you've got to do is prohibit me. Knowing he couldn't prohibit her because Allah's Messenger Wasallam had said, don't prohibit women from going to the mosque. He said, you know I can't do that. She said, in that case, I'll see you in the masjid. <laughs> she kept coming until the day he died. What Umar did do, now this is true, and this is related in the Musannaf of Ibn Abi Shayba and some of these other works of hadith, is he stopped boys and girls hanging around in the masjid outside of prayer time. He said, this is, one time he came in and he noticed a young girl and a young boy and they were looking at one another and he said, 
what is going on here la aruddukunna harair i'm going to restore you to being noble people again what it, what's going on here i'm going to make you noble people again and then he and then he told all of the girls get out of the mosque you can only come for salah so he didn't stop them coming from to the mosque he stopped them lingering and hanging out in between prayer times where people were then maybe you know becoming influenced young people will always be young people they were at the time of the sahaba they are today those challenges must not put us off it means that we have to be careful in how we uh, engineer the, the the situation but it doesn't mean that oh subhanallah nowadays there is fitna so we have to close everything there's been fitna from day one brothers it's not like uh, people just became attracted to one another in 20 uh, in the 20th 21st century if it hadn't been happening earlier, none of us would have been born. It's been happening from day one. Boys and girls, men and women have found each other relatively attractive. right? And that's a healthy thing. Alhamdulillah. There are some places, you know, we, there are big problems going on because that's no longer the case. So we pray that Allah keeps our boys interested in girls and our girls interested in boys. And no, no other way, inshallah. But then we have to be, learn how to be, how to. And there's a period, the Prophet ﷺ said, Shabab shu'batun min al junoon. Youth is a, 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 a branch of insanity. Anyone who's young is partly mad. <laughs> Did you know that? You're ever so slightly insane. A shabab shu'batun min al junoon. Because a mad person walks around inflicting harm on himself and harm on others and people are young you see all sorts of crazy things going on and young guys in cars and all sorts of things what's happening there's there's all sorts of things taking place neurologically and hormonally and so for a short period of time we take leave of our senses we become a little bit mad and then alhamdulillah we grow up again what we're meant to if we don't now we have delayed maturity because people are still playing playstation 4 into their 30s and so that's another problem anyway so this is we have to try to in that period, this volatile period of Shabab, the rest of the community has to help, not hinder the spiritual growth of our Shabab. This is the point. It's easy to close the door, say, no, 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 Masajid can't have, you didn't close anything else. The clubs are open, the, 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 the boozers are open, the parks, the back alleys, everything else is there. And now they all carry, everyone's got a phone in their pocket. That's all it takes now. You don't even have to leave the bedroom, alhamdulillah. Right? People are in their rooms and you think, MashaAllah, my son, my daughter, so good, never comes out of the room, always doing homework. <laughs> they, you, they really don't have that amount of homework. You need to check. So, and sometimes things are taking place. They're, on, they're communicating all day and all night. So instead of that, don't leave them. And say, you kept them in the house, that's enough. Engage with them. And the mosque is a healthy place for engage, engagement, spiritual engagement, maturity with. Some of the things I've said today, you can't say to your children. <laughs> It's awkward, it's, it's difficult if they're at a certain age, you can't say this. But if you can't bring them to the masjid, the imam, the, 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 the program can take place that can address these things. You can have a special youth program. Things that help to nurture, to develop. We will go through our children, our youth, will go through this very tricky phase. When we went through it, it wasn't so tricky. The internet had not yet been invented. Smartphones did not exist. People had, the only type of phone we had was, was one that was plugged into a wall somewhere. Right, so none of this stuff made sense. Now, youth have so many challenges, so many challenges, and the answer is not close your close the doors and close your eyes. The answer is to have our eyes open and have our masajid open and engage in a wise way, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, Jazakumullah khairan, may Allah Azza bless us and forgive us, and I pray that we have a great barakah in this community. I'll make a small dua, Jazakumullah khairan. And um, keep up the wonderful work you're doing and be an example for other places. And every masjid has a community and has young people, boys and girls. And, uh, and, and we need to encourage this, you know, wherever we are, wherever we can.